So Mark chapter 1, verse 14, but before you do that, before I do that, let's read something else. Ezekiel. What in the world does Ezekiel have to do with Mark? Uh, you're going to find out. Ezekiel 1, beginning with verse 4, I'm going to read just a few of the verses here in this chapter. Ezekiel writes, As I looked, behold, a stormy wind came out of the north, and a great cloud with brightness around it, and fire flashing forth continually. And in the midst of the fire, as it were, gleaming metal, and from the midst of it came the likeness of four living creatures. Their appearance, down in verse 13, was like burning coals of fire, like the appearances of torches moving to and fro among the four living creatures. And the fire was bright, and out of the fire went forth lightning, and the living creatures darted to and fro like the appearance of a flash of lightning. So these four living creatures look like lightning flashing across the sky. And over the heads of the living creatures, there was a lightness like an expanse, shining like awe-inspiring crystal spread out above their heads. Such was the sky. And above the expanse over their heads, there was the likeness of a throne, an appearance like sapphire, and seated on the likeness of a throne was a likeness like a human being. And upward from what appeared to be his waist, it looked like gleaming metal. And below, from what looked like his waist, also appeared to be gleaming metal. And there was brightness around him. Like the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud on the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness all around. And such was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell on my face. Bible scholars call passages like this, and you'll find some 50 of them in the Old Testament, theophanies. You don't have to know that word in order to go to heaven, but you ought to know what it means. A theophany is when God shows up. It's an amazing thing. There are, as I said, some 50 of these in the Old Testament, thereabouts. This particular one occurs about 593 B.C. It occurs in the region of Babylon. Many, though not all, of God's people are political prisoners in Babylon. And because they're political prisoners, they've come to the conclusion that God, is, God has forgotten them, that God has abandoned them. And the reason that God shows up like this, and Ezekiel can describe it like this, is because God wants them to know that even in Babylon, and that's where Ezekiel sees this theophany, that even in Babylon, God has not abandoned his people, nor has he forgotten them. God is right there with them. When the Gospel of Mark opens, there's another theophany. Although, I got to admit, it's nothing like Ezekiel's. It is not accompanied by the hum of angel wings, nor the sound of rushing water, nor the sound of a marching army, nor visions of molten lead, nor even fire. Instead, the announcement, and that would be the four living creature business, the announcement of the coming of God is made by a grizzled old prophet who wears a pair of leather short pants and carries around a camel hair throw. His name is John, and they call him the baptizer. And he goes out and he preaches, repent, the kingdom of God is near. And so God comes. But not like a, someone in the heavens, but like a young man who steps out into the wilderness where John is and he comes to be baptized by John. 
And the whole scene there is rather short. The important thing there in Mark is that God himself announces from heaven, Kipasa. God has come near. And Mark picks up the story, leaves a lot out, not interested in that. He's got a point to make. He moves immediately to where when John the baptizer was killed by Herod. And he says, after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee. There's our scripture text for today. Proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent. Believe the gospel. And passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me, and I'll make you to be fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on a little further, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in the boat mending their nets. They were fishermen too. And immediately he called them, follow me. And they did. They left their father, and they left the boat, and they left the nets, and they left the hired servants, and they followed Jesus. Believe the gospel. The kingdom of God is here. The book of Mark is all about the gospel. In fact, you would think that all the gospels are about the gospel, right? That's why you call them the gospels. Gospel of Matthew, Gospel of Mark, Gospel of Luke, Gospel of John. But don't you find it interesting that John doesn't mention the word gospel at all? And Luke doesn't mention the word gospel at all? And Matthew only mentions it four times in 28 chapters? But Mark mentions the gospel eight times in 16 chapters. And three of those times are in the very first chapter. The gospel. The good news. Now, by the way, if you're reading your Bible and you say, I think I've seen this before in Luke. Luke talks about preaching the good news, but he never uses the word gospel. And the good news is that God has stepped into our world. He had never done that before, but he did it then, and he did it for all time. And stepping into our world, he brought about the rule of God, the kingdom of God. Of God, which should cause us to pause a little bit and think about this. I thought God ruled the world. But when you look around, Brock mentioned some of that this morning. Does it look like God is ruling the world? It certainly doesn't seem like that. But the text doesn't say that God has come to rule in the kingdoms of men. The text says that God has come and with him he has brought his own kingdom. The kingdom of God does not consist of the kingdoms of the world. But isn't God always ruling? Doesn't God rule in the kingdoms of men? Isn't that what Daniel says, that God gives the kingdoms to whomever he pleases? Yes, God always gets his way. But they aren't the kingdoms of God. God has brought about something new. A new world order has arrived, and it has been brought about by God's personal arrival into this world. So how do I know? How do I know that God has arrived and God's realm, his kingdom, has arrived? How can I be sure of that? And Mark moves immediately to, to talk about this. It, strangely, Mark moves almost immediately to talk about the, the, the temptations of Jesus, but it's like one verse. Matthew gives it a lot more attention. Luke gives it a lot more attention. Mark gives it almost no attention. You would think that Jesus being tempted by the devil would be a really big deal. But Mark wants you to understand that Jesus is God. And next to Jesus, the devil ain't no big deal. So it simply says Jesus was tempted by the devil, but obviously... That wasn't a big deal. And the wild animals were there. Jesus wasn't bothered by them. And the angels came and ministered to Jesus. I expect that, don't you? 
if God would show up, wouldn't God bring his entourage? Yeah. The angels minister unto Jesus. As Mark moves on in his book, Mark says this, God who has come demonstrates incredible power. I hope you've got your Bibles open to Mark chapter 1. Read these verses, verse, beginning with verse 21. They went to Capernaum. It's Jesus and his disciples. And immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and was teaching. And they were astonished at his teaching because he taught as someone with authority. Isn't that the way you'd expect God to teach? With authority. Jesus does. Jesus teaches with authority and not like the scribes. And immediately there was a man who enters into the synagogue who has an unclean spirit. And the unclean spirit, who's nothing more than a minion of the devil, the unclean spirit cries out. And the unclean spirit says to Jesus, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are. You're the Holy One of God. What does Jesus say? Shut up. Okay. Satan is something, but he ain't nothing compared to Jesus. Jesus tells him, you be quiet and get out of that guy. Come out of him. Satan doesn't leave willingly. The unclean spirit convulses the man and cries out with a loud voice, but he does what he's told. He leaves. And the people say, what in the world is this all about? A new teaching with authority. He commands even unclean spirits and they obey him. And Jesus' fame spreads throughout Galilee. Here is God come into our world. What do you expect here? A parade? Yeah, that's what we expect. A parade. We expect angelic beings. We expect molten metal. We expect fire. But Jesus didn't come for all of that. Jesus did not come for himself. He did not come to put on a show. Jesus came to help people. And so immediately this God who has stepped into our world goes to the home of Simon Peter. And Simon Peter's mother-in-law is sick with a fever. And in the ancient world, we, we look at fever, we say, well, that's a symptom of infection or something like that. In the ancient world, they didn't look at fever as, as a symptom. They looked at fever as being a real a real problem, a real disease. It was a fire within people's bodies, and it was a fire that was kindled by God. One rabbi says that fire is greater than the fire faced by Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the book of Daniel because only God can quench the fire of fever. And Jesus comes, and Jesus heals Peter's mother-in-law of the fever. It's, it's no big deal. And he heals her to the point that she's able to get up and to serve them. And then, in verse 40, a leper came to Jesus, imploring him, kneeling before him, and he said, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus moved with pity. This God who has stepped into our world, has stepped into our world to take notice of mankind, to have feeling for mankind, to help mankind. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him and said, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him, and he was clean. This new world order that has come, has come to make people's lives better. And everywhere in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus makes people's lives better. But that brings us to another point about the Gospel. Point number one was God has stepped into our world. Point number two is God has brought with him his kingdom, the realm in which God rules, the realm in which he calls people. But that's the third point. God has invited others not to witness his power, but to become a part of it. Jesus invites his disciples to follow him, to be involved in the mission of making people's lives better. And when Jesus describes their work, he says, follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. When you fish, if you're successful anyway, I've never been too successful at fishing, but when you fish, 
you change the life of the fish, don't you? The life of the fish is changed drastically. And Jesus has been changing drastically the lives of the people he's come into contact with. And when he comes into contact with Peter and Andrew and James and John, he drastically changes their lives. They leave their jobs. They leave their livelihood. They leave their family. They leave their assets in order that they might follow Jesus. Their lives have been changed because they have entered into the rule of God, which is greater than the rule of any man. The gospel is that God has stepped into our world. and He's brought about a new world order. The gospel is that God has invited us into his realm, into his order. The gospel is that God has come to make our lives better. The gospel is that God has called us to make other people's lives better. The gospel involves leaving the old life behind. And it requires obedience to the king. There's a part of that leper story I didn't read you a minute ago. I want to read it now. It's in verse 43. After Jesus healed the leper, he sternly charged, don't miss that word. He sternly charged the leper and said, see that you don't say anything to anybody. But you go and show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded as a proof to them. There's a ceremony you have to go through in order to be proclaimed clean, and you got to do it because that's what the law says. Don't say anything to anybody. Did you see those two things? Offer yourself to the priest. Don't say anything to anybody. What's the guy do? If he ever went to the priest, he does not, the, the text does not say it, right? Don't you think that if he did that, the text would say something about it? I mean, it's a really big deal. Jesus charged him how? Sternly. You make sure you get this done. We'd like to see the guy go do it. But evidently he didn't. And Jesus told him the second thing, don't tell anybody. What's he do? He went out, began to talk freely about it and to spread the news so that Jesus could no longer openly enter a town was out in desert places. Ah, that's where the story starts, is in the desert. And people were coming to him from every quarter. When we read that, sometimes we're tempted, you know, to think that Jesus told him not to tell anybody, knowing that he would, but used a little reverse psychology on him. That's not what the word sternly means. Jesus wasn't playing around. And Jesus wasn't doing it because... This guy would cause him trouble because Jesus can handle the trouble. After all, he handled the devil, right? Those aren't the reasons. It doesn't matter what the reason was that Jesus told this guy to be quiet and to, not to tell anybody. The fact of the matter is he told him to be quiet. Don't tell anybody. But the guy didn't obey. The man did not obey Jesus, and though he was healed, he did not come under the kingdom of God. Why not? Because when you are under the kingdom of God, you obey the king. When God shows up, if you want to be a part of God's realm, if you want to join him in his work, in his mission, it cannot be done without wholehearted obedience. It cannot be done unless you are submissive to the king who is our Lord. And that's the message today. If you're going to be a part of the kingdom of God, you've got to submit to the king. Let's stand and sing.